Welcome back to Dead Good Book Reviews. I'm Judith and you are watching another episode of Overbooked, the series where I talk about every single book on my shelf because otherwise the terrifying three-headed dog behind the camera is going to eat me. Okay, she doesn't have three heads, but she is pretty cute. Today we are going to talk about The Companions Quartet by Julia Ember. This is a very shiny book. I have, whether it be a physical copy from way back when or on Kindle, I have bought every single book in the series for myself. Nobody's paying me to talk about books, all opinions are my own. There are gonna be some minor spoilers for book one just to get us into the story. Nothing that's going to ruin it for you. But if you do want to go into the series knowing absolutely nothing, I suggest you pause this video, click away now, go read them, come back when you're done and we'll have a chat about it then. Or just go read book one, that would probably do you. The Companions Quartet Quartet is, unsurprisingly, a set of four books that were published by Oxford University Press between 2006 and 2007. I can't remember exactly when I first read them, but it must have been around about that time because I would have been about 12, no, 10, 11, roughly, somewhere around that age, and I, I would have read them and enjoyed them. I can actually told you what books are in the series. Secret of the Sirens is book one, Gorgon's Gaze, The Gorgon's Gaze is book two, book three is The Minds of the Minotaur, and book four is The Curse of the Chimera. Um, they are all great. In Googling the series, however, I realized that there was actually a companion novel called something. Did I write down what it was called? No. <laughs> it was released in 2011 and you can best believe I will be picking it up as soon as I have book buying budget. Julia Golding has written all sorts of stuff under various different names, so I will link her website that has all of the different pseudonyms and so such down below so you can go check that out for yourself. She's an English author, she's worked for the Foreign Office, she's worked for Oxfam, she's done heaps of stuff and she's now a freelance writer. This story takes place in the fictional, didn't know it was fictional until I was doing this video, but I'd realised I'd never heard of it outside of these books before. English seaside town of Hescombe, where 11 year old Connie Lionheart has been sent to live with her eccentric aunt. Connie has always been a little bit of a weird kid with an affinity for animals, but little did she know this was a manifestation, <gasps> a manifestation of her affinity with mythical creatures, who are very very real and very very endangered. Connie's aunt is a member of the Society for the Protection of Mythical Creatures and in book one Connie and her newfound friends in the society take on the society's biggest nemesis. I have a huge amount of nostalgia for this series as a whole. Um, I've read this particular book more times than I care to count. I love it. I've read it so many times. This was basically everything I wanted as a child. As a child who was super into mythology, uh, as a child who was super into admin and societies and the idea of joining something and belonging to something. Ugh. It spoke to me, okay? Everyone else was waiting for their Hogwarts letter. I was, well, I was waiting for my Hogwarts letter, but I was also waiting to be told which mythical creature I would be a companion to because obviously I would be. I even have the badge to prove it. It is somewhere in the attic, but I do have a badge. It's been in a video before, but it's like a little badge and you could write them an email and they would sign you up and they would send you a letter with your acceptance to the society. And I, oh, it was perfect. It was everything I could have wanted. There was something about not only are mythical creatures real, but there is a system and you can be assessed and you can pass a test. I really like passing exams as a kid. So that, that appealed to me a lot. Uh, and there are kind of qualifications and stuff. And it, it really felt like there were systems in place by which one could become a part of the society and I really wanted that. A lot of the focus of these books is on the environment. Obviously with the protection of mythical creatures a lot of that comes with protecting the environments in which they live. So a lot of the tension points within the story of all four books will be to do with uh, someone is trying to destroy or impact negatively the landscape, which is particularly significant in this seaside town. So the first book has an oil refinery. That's one of the things that's happening and Connie is dealing with some mythical creatures that are being impacted by that. Um, and what I like about the books is that I think they are very good at expressing individual responsibility for combating against bigger things, doing bad things, but they aren't just saying like, just recycle and everything will be fine, which I think is an important message for children to get is that actually we need to talk about both collective responsibility and we need to talk about big industry doing bad things. The power that you have as a young person to use your voice to, to fight for your community and to fight for the environment generally. And I think that was really something I didn't internalize as much as a kid as I did rereading them now, but comparing that to something like, for example, the Maximum Ride books, which are a little bit older, aimed at a little bit of an older audience than this, but they got real preachy really fast and it didn't really fit with the ideas in the book, it just suddenly became about the environment and that was the point where I stopped reading them. I've talked about that before. Well, by the by. Whereas in this, it fits with these mythical creatures need protecting, so we need to protect the environment, so I'm gonna tell you how to do that. Another thing I really like about this series is that, exception of a companion novel published a few years later, there are only four books in this series. This would have been something that you could so easily have dragged out into, you know, 20 book series that felt really cash grabby and by the end you were dealing with like, 
a mythical creature that nobody had ever heard of, right? Whereas I think in this case we have full books, the story escalates to just where it needs to and then it finishes. And I really like that. I like that it feels like there was a story to tell and then we told it and now we're done. Maybe I'm just hung up on the fact that I have so many more Animorphs books to read before that project is done. Some things to bear in mind if I, you're watching this video and you're thinking, oh, maybe I'll pick that up. If you don't like middle grade, this isn't going to be for you. I know a lot of the criticisms about this book are saying like the language is kind of trite and like there's some other stuff going on. I didn't find that as a child. Uh, I don't particularly find that as an adult, but I can see how if you just read these as an adult without my nostalgia glasses on, uh, you might not enjoy it. So if this was your first foray into middle grade, go in knowing that, right? But I think a lot of people who enjoy middle grade know what they're going in for. My other con is that I do believe that you can no longer get the badge. Um, I haven't tried, I haven't emailed Oxford University Press to ask them if you can still get the badge, but I'm gonna guess that, you know, 15 years on, they will no longer send badges to you. Alas and alack. I think the only other thing I'd bring up is that while there are characters from other cultures brought in, this is a very predominantly white book, um, that's, you know, pretty typical of things from 2006, 2007. Um, the later books really bring in a broader sense of mythological creatures from around the world, but we are focused in on Heskem for the entirety of the series. We never go anywhere else. So I think if you were wanting something that brought in mythology from all around the world into one story in that way, this isn't that. I don't know what that is. And if that exists, please tell me because I want to read it. I want to inject it into myself. This is not that. But yeah, you've got to fill out this form. Urgently required. New members sought for the Companions Club. Are you a creature companion? Do you have the special powers need to keep? That is a typo. Do you have the special powers need to communicate with mythical beasts? Ah, take our companion assessment to see if you have what it takes. New members will be sent a club badge to mark them out as the companion to their mythical creature. Receive regular email updates about official society business from the trustees. I don't think I ever did receive that, but you know. By the way, uh, receive downloads from their desktop with their own companion symbol. That's for their desktops. So who wrote this? Be able to send comments and ideas about the stories for posting on the website. What website? How exciting. Be eligible to enter special society competitions to win fantastic prizes and so much more. So don't delay. Emails from trustees. Ugh. Okay, so I tried to find the website and the Wayback Machine has it, but alas, you can no longer take the quiz because Flash Player is broken. Some comparisons, some other things you might want to read if this sounded up your alley or if you wanted to read this or to reverse compare if you're like, oh, would I like that if I've read this? We'll see. Um, Percy Jackson is the obvious one for mythology. I think that's probably the other biggest mythology thing. I've only read the original Percy Jackson series. I've not read any of the others barring like a couple here and there. I haven't given over myself to that series just yet. It might happen. 2022 might be the year. I think that that has a lot of similar um, you could be a demigod, you just don't know it yet kind of stuff. This this also has. You could have an affinity for mythical creatures, you just don't know it yet. Oh, I wish. I was trying to think of anything else like that where there are kind of like secret societies you can access. <sighs> I don't know if I have any behind me. This is the thing. I don't read a lot of stuff that's set in the real world. <laughs> I will have a ponder and I will add any more to the description if I can think of any. Have you read these? Did you read these as a child? What were your childhood formative reads? Because this was, this was definitely one of mine. Let me know down in the comments below what your thoughts are. While you're down there commenting, if you haven't already, please do subscribe. It makes me feel loved and appreciated, especially as we draw close to the end of the year when I will have been doing Overbooked for a whole year. How exciting. You can also follow me on social media. I'm back on Twitter very, very briefly. I'm just sort of dipping my toe back in and it's going okay so far. Uh, and I'm also on Discord. That's all linked below as well. Come have chats about books. I will send you pictures of my non-three-headed dog. How wonderful. That's all from me and I will see you in the next one. It's got a piece of bloopers now. <sighs> protection, protection. We'll edit that bit in a bit earlier, I think. How about that? So that I look like I've got my head together. Oh, girl. She's just gonna scratch her collar and not the camera. Thank you for that. Thank you for shaking the camera that whole time. Now I've got to read it again.